Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Fastly uh, and to Papers We Love. My name is Elaine. I run community and events here at Fastly. Uh, if you don't know, Fastly is a very developer-friendly CDN. We give you awesome real-time analytics. We fold right into your stack. We are optimized for mobile and API stuff. We do it all. Uh, and essentially, uh, what I want to tell you is that we really like to help the community. As you've noticed, we've essentially had uh, this meetup be like our resident meetup in the past few months, which is awesome. And um, we're always looking to help out more meetups. If you want to get one started, we'd love to help. If you want us to just contribute our space and food and promotion, we'll gladly do that too. If you run an open source project, um, that you want to be a little faster, we'll gladly give you some free Fastly for that. So anything community open source related, we're happy to help. And additionally, we are hiring engineering, sales, marketing, everything essentially. Everything's on the site. If you don't see something you like up on there, we're probably also hiring that esoteric position that you want. So um, just reach out when we're, we're also working late. We're here to help and to chat if you want, so um, just come find me or anyone else back there and we'll talk. All right. Okay, everybody, um, a little bit of administrative trivia because this is a portion of the evening where I tell you what is coming up. Uh, November, we have Lee Walsh from the New York City uh, Papers Who Love chapter and he's gonna be talking about trees and how to actually um, make sure that you can tell what ancestry looks like from, from a tree's like, data structure. So. Um, just come to that, it, will, it should be very nice. And in uh, December, we have Peter Velius. And then everything is in the meetup. Uh, we also have meetups lined up until July of next year, but let it not discourage you. If you wanna talk, uh, let me know, and I will make, make room for you. And there's almost like an entire year of difference, so I mean, it could be future you problem. I really like whenever people that come to the group also present, so um, I will bug you as the time comes near and I will help you out. So if you have something that you really wanna talk about or if you have an idea that actually like shaped you as an engineer or as, uh, if you have anything, just like come and let me know and, um, and I'll help you get, like, get in the schedule. So without further ado, uh, also uh, the bathrooms are over there. And uh, there's uh, like anything you wanna drink over here, there's a keg and uh, some cold brew. Uh, so help yourselves to anything you want. And um, without further ado, we're going to give it to Kyle. Kyle Kingsbury, everybody. Woo. Thank you, Ines. Okay, uh, so everybody please uh, put down your, your trays of food and stand up. Okay, we're all gonna squat because I miss Jim today. So, arms up and down as far as you can go and back up. That's one and two, down, up, three, down, up. Wonderful, good job everyone. Um, if you would like, you can also take this opportunity to move forward because we're gonna be talking about math and it's gonna be really small. Uh, how, do we, how do we go over? Command tab. Mm -hmm. Ah, wonderful. Okay, so uh, my name is Kyle Kingsbury. Uh, in a past life, I was a physicist, and this slide said 2009. I had not given this talk in, a, I guess, five years, uh, which is going to make this a little bit exciting. We're going to switch modes. This meetup is not a programming meetup. It's about physics. It's about a different way to prove and discuss uh, problems. Uh, it's going to be math heavy, but I'm going to try and give you as many analogies as I can. As a quick overview, because it's not obvious when you read this paper, um, the Casimir effect is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. It's, it's due to the electromagnetic field structure. It's due to the geometry of the field. Uh, and it's dependent on the boundary conditions of the system. Boundary conditions are constraints, things like having edges or walls. Um, it's, it's this very sort of mysterious phenomenon to us because it doesn't involve any sort of real forces, any real particles. It's all just due to the structure of the field itself. We're gonna see what that means. Now this is not how the paper actually phrases itself. In 1948, um, 
there was sort of this unsolved problem of colloids, which are things like milk or mud. We wanted to know why mud was sticky. And physics didn't have a good answer for this. Uh, so we had these, these forces that were supposed to join particles together and hold them. Um, and they're supposed to go like r to the negative 6. So if you go, if you double the distance between two particles, the force should fall off as uh, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64 times smaller. But instead, they actually went off 128 times smaller, r to the 7th. And this is a big problem in physics. Well, Verwin Overbeek um, and then later Casimir and Polder were trying to account for this difference in the forces. They said the experiment doesn't match the data. We might be able to explain it by saying that in order for a particle to tell another particle that it is attracted to it, it needs to send a message via some photon, and it takes time for light to propagate between those two. So although these, this is a very classical electrodynamic problem, it doesn't involve any quantum mechanics, they said relativity, the finite light's propagation speed, means that any forces between these two particles will be delayed based on their distance. So at far distances, the force will be affected by that propagation speed. Um, now, this actually fixes the problem. Uh, they, they found the same difference, that at short distances, there's r to the negative third. At long distances, r to the negative fourth. There's that extra factor of 1 over x. Um, and that, that accounted for the behavior in the experiments. They thought, hey, this is a great success. They've reproduced the existing experimental results. However, there's this sort of side note. Casimir goes off on his own and says, hey, you know, we, could, we did this all in terms of particles bouncing back and forth and, and light speed propagation, but what if we thought about it using this newfangled quantum mechanics thing? Um, what if we interpret it as a vacuum field uh, structure effect instead of being delayed particles? And it turns out that both of these ways of looking at the problem are equivalent. So he publishes this footnote. <laughs> it's, it's this really tiny paper. It doesn't receive really any attention for about 20 years. Um, and nowadays, it's what we know Casimir for. It's this very important, very mysterious problem. But at the time, we thought it was a lot simpler. So to back up, because you're all probably wondering, like, what the heck are fields, and what is math, and why are we even here? Uh, <laughs> quick primer in physics. A field is an entity, something associated with every point in space. So if it's a, a number field, you know, here might be value number one. Here's a two, five, one, seven, four. Every point in space has some number. And there's going to be some field dynamics that relate those numbers. So maybe they have to vary continuously. Or maybe they're allowed to rotate but not to expand or contract. Maybe, maybe the field has direction and it can only point in certain directions or it can only change over time in certain ways. These are called field dynamics. And we use fields to explain forces. So when I push down on this desk, I'm, I'm using the electromagnetic force to bounce back up. Uh, the gravitational force between me and the Earth is mediated as well by a gravitational field. So field dynamics, and, and specifically quantum field dynamics, were this field of, well, <laughs> different kind of field, were a, a topic of a lot of exploration new research uh, when Polder and Casimir are writing. We knew, classically, from Maxwell, this set of equations describes the electromagnetic field. It's, it's two fields in one. It's the electric field. That's what gives you like static electricity when you rub your head and it gets um, fuzzy and balloons are uh, stuck to it. Uh, and then there's the magnetic field, which is what lets you run car crushers and stick things to fridges and whatnot. Um, those two fields can be unified into the same set of dynamics by these equations. And if we, if we consider a world where there's no charges, like no electrons or protons, um, and where there's no uh, changing currents, like no, no electricity flowing, uh, the equations have this beautiful symmetry. You'll notice these equations for the electron field and these equations for the magnetic, magnetic field, B, they've got the same structure. This symbol here, nabla dot, or del dot, that means that the divergence, the ability of the field to expand or contract, is zero. Um, this makes sense because there's no, there's no charges. You can't have fields radiate away from something where there's no charge. Uh, this right here, del cross, that means that the curl of the field, the, the rotatingness of it, is affected by the change in the magnetic field over time. So if you have an increased magnetic field, if your magnetic field is getting stronger and stronger and stronger, the electric field is going to curl around it. And vice versa, the same thing happens for the B field. These two things are related, uh, sort of like complementary pairs. They feed on each other. So sort of like a, a robber's equation. And that, that sort of relationship where A feeds on B and B feeds on A, and both of them have derivatives, 
has a special set of solutions called waves. So Maxwell's equations actually turn out to give us these waves of electric and magnetic fields that propagate through space, and we, we call those light. Um, this was, this was a, a well understood sort of classical electrodynamics problem, um, but we started to reconceptualize it in terms of quantum mechanics, and then things got a little bit weird. Classically, we say that waves move at speed c, that's the speed of light. Um, they've got some sort of frequency, that's omega right here, looks like a little bit w. Uh, the frequency is the um, sort of how often the wave is going to bounce up and down, the how often the field will switch direction. Uh, they've got an energy proportional to the wave. Uh, their wavelength is gonna be inversely related to the frequency, so that's how long the waves are. You think about long, slow waves, very low energy, really fast waves shaking uh, at high frequencies are gonna be very short. The last bit of physics you'll need to know is about metals. We discovered this unusual thing in metals where the electrons are free, they can kind of flow around a little bit. And what that means is that when you have an electric field like the one that comes with a light wave and it touches a metal, the electrons are gonna move to counteract the field. And they specifically enforce the constraint that the field's strength can be zero anywhere parallel to the surface of the metal. It can be positive in or out, but at that plate interface, it can't have any sideways components. And when a wave hits something and it isn't allowed to move up and down, it bounces back. This is why mirrors work. When, when a light wave hits a mirror, uh, the electrons bounce around and vibrate in the opposite way to the light wave and it counteracts the light wave's sort of desired oscillation and it bounces back with the opposite sort of phase. Um, and, and this constraint, you could think of it like, uh, if you've got a slinky and you tie one in down, you kind of like do a little wave, you know how the slinky will bounce back afterwards? You get like an extra little copy of the wave that comes back towards you? It's that same phenomenon. Fixing the edges gives you reflection. So, with this in mind, uh, Everything was great until quantum mechanics shows up and they say, hey, hold on, um, the wave function you're used to can't, can't be continuous. You can't have any frequencies, you can't have any energies anymore. Now you have to have quantized energies. They have to come in discrete steps. So if you're, if you're thinking about um, the height of people playing jump rope, you know, uh, in a classical jump rope game, you're allowed to have the rope go as high as you like. In a quantum jump rope game, you can have it go this high or this high or this high, you know, in units of n, but you can't have the in-between sizes. Weird effect. And the reason that happens is because of the structure of the Hamiltonian. So you've all seen this before, and we're gonna move, oh wait, you haven't seen a Hamiltonian? Okay. So, <laughs> so for those of you who have not seen quantum mechanics before, you literally can even quantum. Um, the things you need to know when you're reading a modern quantum mechanics paper, you're gonna see a lot of these puppies right here. This is called a bra. It has a little angle bracket on one side and a little vertical bar there. This is like a question. You, you can think of it like, hey, are you confused? And you all say yes. Um, this over here, this is a ket. It's a state. So this represents the state of someone who's confused. Uh, we use these states in physics for things like um, spin up or uh, a particle being at position two or position zero. Every, every different thing you could say about an object has a ket and a corresponding bra. Really, they're not, they're not really questions and states. You could, you could interpret them either way, so one's a state and one's a question. But they're two halves, like an interlocking puzzle piece. They come together, and when they collide, they sort of answer the question. So a confused bra hitting a confused ket makes a bra ket, we call this a bracket. That's a joke. Uh, <laughs> I'm not joking, this is the actual technical term. Um, and what happens here is it, it gives you the probability that this state will be observed in this state. So if you are confused, you will always be observed to be confused. Um, if you're in this room, the probability of you being confused is probably about 0.99, so that's the answer you would get out there. Sometimes it'll be zero. Like uh, if I am standing up and down, the probability is zero that I'm lying on the floor. So if you brought those two bras and cats together, you'd get back zeros. The other new piece of notation you need is this little hat here. This denotes something called an operator. Um, this operator, you could say like R is the read paper operator. I've got a rotation operator that spins me. There's actually three of them, right? I can spin three different directions. Um, 
There's a movement operator that takes you side to side. There's a position operator that measures your position. All the things in quantum mechanics that you might want to do to a state are represented as operators. And when an operator hits a ket, it transforms it. So before you came to this meetup, you were all probably living happy lives. Then you read the paper, and you became confused. So this is how to read quantum mechanics papers. Any questions thus far? Wonderful. No questions. Uh, so there's an operator that's really special in quantum mechanics. It's called H hat. It's the Hamiltonian. Uh, it's going to take your system and move it forward one step in time. If you've ever written an animation in JavaScript, uh, or if you've ever written like a simulation program, um, you'll have like a step function that kind of like jumps you forward one step at a time. That's the Hamiltonian. It's going to take your current state and give you back a state a really, really, really tiny, infinitely tiny step later. The other weird thing that comes out of this amazing badass named Emma Neuther is uh, <laughs> we have this, this theorem in quantum mechanics that tells us the Hamiltonian, the, the thing that moves the system forward in time, also corresponds to the energy of the system. And this is a really beautiful and deep result linked to the spectral theorem. It's linked to linear algebra. There's all sorts of amazing connections here. You should really go read about it. But we're going to take it on faith <laughs> that these things are related. So this Hamiltonian comes from Maxwell's equations. Those four equations we wrote earlier can be rephrased in a quantum formalism. And what it tells us is that the Hamiltonian, the operator that moves you forward in time, is a sum. That's the sigma. So we're going to get a copy of this thing for every distinct value of k and every distinct value of lambda. k here is a, a, a wave number. It's, it's the size of the wave you want. So I want a wave that's 10 meters long that direction. That's a specific wave number k. Or a wave that's 5 meters long that direction. That's a, another wave number. And then light can be polarized either up, down, or left, right, or circular, or other. There's, there's two polarizations. Um, and so we have to have an extra copy, one for each wave that light can be polarized. On the inside, we've got this little thing called h-bar. That's the fundamental uh, scale of quantum mechanics. It's the sort of energy and time unit. Everything comes in chunks at h-bar. Omega, that's that frequency we talked about. So higher frequencies have higher energy. They rotate faster. Um, then there's two operators here. And these correspond, for really beautiful and strange reasons, to annihilation and creation operators. They destroy photons or they create them in the field. And then finally, there's a one-half term. The one-half comes out of the way that you define the annihilation and creation operators. This whole big, messy equation simplifies down into this structure which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, why would you take a photon out of a system and put it right back in? Like, what does that have any physical significance for? Uh, math. Yeah, quantum's like that. <laughs> so working with the annihilation and creation operators is really simple. If I've got a box that has zero photons in it, and I apply the uh, creation operator, a dagger, it'll give me a, a back of box with one photon. And if I do it on a box with one photon, I'll get two photons. And with two, I'll get three. So this is like the increment operator, right? If I wanted to subtract photons, I use A. So A on two gives me one. A on one gives me the state zero. A on the state zero does not give me a state at all. You cannot decrement past zero. There's no, there's no negative numbers of photons. So the ability, you, just, you can't do this at all. The amplitude of, of getting back a state less than zero is zero. When we talk about photons, um, physicists will talk about wave packets. They're sort of um, these little bundles of different waves, and, and they come in, in nice chunks. Uh, normal people like me will think about photons as these little sort of fuzzy particles that bounce around. I'm going to bounce one into the crowd here. Uh, so photons uh, are, the, are the quanta of the electromagnetic field. It's the little chunk that all of your energy gets to come in. And a dagger will add one of these photons to the field. So I just applied a dagger to the classroom by throwing that photon in. And now you, as the electromagnetic field, are going to manipulate and interact with that photon. If we talk about the electromagnetic field being kind of like a soccer game, where all the players are photons, and maybe they're kicking around some buckyball or something, uh, <laughs> this is, I, I have lots of cute metaphors today. Um, so we can imagine, like, here's a field, and it's got, it's got a high energy because there's a lot of photons in it. You know, every time you throw in a photon, the energy goes up. Um, but if you suck out all the photons using our, our A hat uh, vacuum cleaner, you might ask, how? <laughs> uh, it's gone. So you might ask, uh, how, how much energy is left in the field? 
Well, we can, we can figure that out using that theorem I talked about from, uh, from quantum mechanics. We can figure out the energy of the system by taking the Hamiltonian and sticking it between the bra and the ket for the ground state. That's zero. So with zero photons in the system, stick the Hamiltonian in the middle, and then we'll just do some algebra. So this is just the definition we wrote before. We can take that state zero and bring it inside the sum. And then we make this interesting observation. You can't take anything away from an empty box. So this A uh, acting on the state zero, that's just going to be zero. It disappears. And so this term disappears. And all that we're left with, all of this stuff just disappears. All we're left with is this sum of zero and then the sum over uh, 1 half h bar omega and then that, um, that empty state. We can pull the state out because it's present in every element of the sum. So we pull it out to the middle here. These two things combine, right? Zero is always zero. Empty is always empty. So that becomes one. The energy of an empty electromagnetic field is the sum over all the wavelengths you could get of 1 half h bar omega. Again, omega is the frequency. This is really bizarre, right? Because this number is not zero. <laughs> you would think that in an empty field, there would be no energy left. But this is not what happens. We get this 1 half h bar omega. So if I, if I give you a box that can only have like one size of wave in it, you're still going to have this extra piece of energy chilling out. We call it, you could think of it kind of like a virtual photon. It's not a real photon, but it's kind of like the possibility of one is still participating in the field dynamics. Um, we call this energy the vacuum energy, the zero point energy, or maybe the ground state energy of the system. If you're wondering how much energy, uh, so you all know how big 510 nanometers is, right? Like this here, I'll show you. This is how big, I think, what, 650 nanometers is? Um, so I just sent you a light wave that's about 650 nanometers long. Um, and you can all measure that with your eyes. Uh, <laughs> no, it's very, it's very, very small. Uh, and remember, they go milli, uh, micro, nano. So we're talking like, what, 10 to the minus ninth meters? Um, that's a vacuum energy of about 1.21 electron volts which is about as big as the transitions in, in atoms from electron level to electron level. Uh, this is actually really slow on a sort of quantum mechanical scale. Typically, like thermal velocities for electrons in materials, like the, the speed they go out when they're just playing their ordinary games, it's like hundreds of meters per second. If you kick a buckyball with 1.21 electron volts, it's going to go about a millimeter per second. So that's how slow the goals are going in this game. It's really, really slow, just tiny amounts of energy. If you want to lift a packing peanut, we're talking about uh, basically 10 to the negative 16th meters, which is about a tenth of the size of a proton. So this is good, because if this number were bigger, you would expect to open up a box from you know, Amazon full of packing peanuts, and they would just like, fly out of the box and roll around everywhere. Uh, they should be jostling around, because there's all this vacuum energy bouncing them, right? Well, luckily, the vacuum energy is small. Or is it? We said it was a sum over all the different values of k. That's all the different possible wavelengths. And how many possible wavelengths are there? Like, give me a wavelength. What's, what's, a, what's a distance? 510 meters, cool. Give me another distance. 12, 1,200 meters, OK, another one? OK, that's terrific. So we've listed all the different distances in the world, right? There's only three, only three numbers. No, you can list infinitely many numbers. There are infinitely many copies of the h bar omega in there. This sum is infinite. It's not, it's not finite. There's infinite energy everywhere. This is really fucked up. Like, why hasn't the universe exploded? I'm just, I'm terrified looking at this equation. It's, so, so this is, this is bad. So let's, let's pretend, let's like, calmly back away and think maybe it's the case that this invisible, like, infinite energy, maybe it's present evenly everywhere. So it's infinity here, infinity here, infinity here. So there's no difference between the infinities. So we can't really go anywhere less energetic. Um, if, if there's no differences in energies, you can't, you can't tell the difference. Everything should behave the same. So maybe that infinity is just this normal base and we pretend it doesn't matter. Um, or does it? This is where the paper comes in. How many people actually read the paper? Awesome. Like, that's like almost a quarter of like a quarter of the people. So uh, the, the paper says, what if we took two plates? They've got sides of length L, so their area is L squared, and they're separated by a little tiny distance A. 
It's like a pizza box, right? You, if you get a little metal pizza box and you close it, you squish it closed. That's, that's the kind of dynamic we're talking about. And we're going to vacuum out all the photons. The box is going to be super dark inside. No photons, low energy. Except all those infinite, oh no. OK, well, so except there are finite modes on the inside. So on the inside, we're going to have electromagnetic waves that correspond to the different modes that are allowed inside the cavity. You can't have every single wave. Because when we're playing our little game of jump rope, remember the metals resist. The metals mean you have to have a zero amplitude at the edge of the metal. So you can only have the sort of main jump rope mode, or like the, the double dutch mode, you know, where there's like going up on one side and down on the other, or the one where there's three peaks or four peaks. They come in integer numbers. There's infinitely many of them. But there's not as many infinities here as there are out here. Outside, every single wavelength is possible. How many people are totally lost right now? Wonderful. So a weird thing occurs. If you think about making this, this box smaller as you like stand on it and squish it down, you're kind of like reducing the density of modes. On the, on the inside, the, the smaller you get, the more spaced out those modes become. So before we could have four modes, and now we can only have two in this tiny unit of space. They, this, this graph goes up to infinity, obviously. Um, but there's, there's less on the inside the smaller it gets. So you think there's less energy, right? Each one of these is 1 half h bar omega. So 1 half h bar, 1 half h bar, 1 half h bar. Um, so as we squeeze it, there's less energy in the inside. And that means the system should want to squeeze closed. We might expect that there's some difference between the plates. So Casimir says, all right, let's, let's subtract the energy difference on the inside and the outside. And we should be able to get some pressure from, from, the, from the energy. Well, this is a common question you all asked as children. What's infinity minus infinity? There are different kinds of infinity. This one's continuous. Every single spectrum value is OK. And on the inside, you've got these discrete bands. You know, Only specific integers are OK. So it's like asking, what's the set of all the real numbers, You know, 1.28745 and all those numbers, minus like the set of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, et cetera? Um, they're actually they're different cardinalities, which is a problem. <laughs> Or maybe not, depending on which branch of uh, math you use. But we say, screw it. We know this is impossible. We're, we're going to soldier on bravely because we're physicists, and we don't give a fuck. Uh, <laughs> physicists really are like the, the honey badgers of mathematicians, right? <laughs> they just don't care. They will go in there and like bite the snake. And yeah, so this is the structure of the equation that shows up in the paper. Um, it's terrifying, but we don't actually have to do any math ourselves because other people have done the math for us. We just need to understand what the math means. Out here, this delta, that means change. This is the change in energy, the difference in energy between the outside and the inside of the, of the plates. L squared, that comes about because of the, the size of the plate, right? Each one is side L. So we expect it to scale with area. You know, the bigger the plates, the more modes you can squeeze into any given unit of volume. H bar is there. That's from the H bar omega in the Hamiltonian. C, speed of light. That shows up because of the way we're doing wavelengths. We, we translated from wave number to wavelength. And so the uh, pi shows up because you know, uh, waves have like pi or 1 over pi oscillations per, per unit time. Um, and then there's this, this sum here and this integral here, and we're subtracting them. So this inside integral from 0 to infinity over n squared plus u, that's, this is all the sideways modes, all of the, all the stuff that's um, parallel to the plates. That's going to stay the same no matter how big you are, because we're not affecting the, the edges L, right? So, so the, if you're talking about the pizza box, you're squishing down all the sideways modes, they're going to be exactly the same size every time. So that's why we see the same integral on the inside. But what's different is on the outside, we've got this sum. This is for the uh, inside modes. Um, sorry, outside of the equation, inside of the box. Inside the box, we have the sum over all the discrete energy levels. And then over here, we've got the integral over every continuous energy level on the outside of the box. So that, that expression, yeah? Um, let's go back. Yeah, there's a sign change here, sorry. Yeah. So we, we just flip this around. Um, but we'll get you know, one or the other. Uh, this is still, unfortunately, infinite. We've, we've subtracted the differences, and we got infinity, which you should expect, right? Because there's many more real numbers than there are um, you know, uh, integers. 
But then, Casimir pulls this thing out of, out of his ass, basically. He says, uh, okay, electrons in metals, they're not really perfect reflectors. Electrons in metals are behaving like mosh pits. So when you, when you try to move electrons um, slowly, they have time to react, and they'll kind of push you back gently. Uh, if you go through really fast at a really high frequency, they'll just kind of jiggle in place. If you, if you try to move a bunch of moshers, um, you know, like in a concerted motion towards the exit of the building, they will, they will resist, and you'll get bounced back. If you jump into them really fast, you'll, do, you'll go crowd surfing. So the virtual photons at high energy are actually crowd surfing right on through the metals. This is why metals become transparent once you get to a high frequency. Uh, so if you, if you take a mirror, right, it's only transparent in like visible wavelengths. If you go get some x-rays, they'll go right on through. Well, it depends on the material. Um, what that means is that the, those constraints on the modes inside the cavity, like the finite modes that are like one, two, three, four, those only work up to some frequency. And then the uh, photons will just start tunneling right through, and then we'll have infinite frequencies again. Yeah? You with me? This, this, should, this should kind of bug you, right? Because we say, all right, we're, gonna, we're just going to multiply by this arbitrary function. We're, we'll scale our, our system. We'll take that integral, and we'll, we'll make the difference between the two zero at some cutoff frequency. So a regulator function is called f. It's going to be 1 for low frequencies. We'll just do the same thing for low frequencies. And once you get up high, we'll smoothly fall off, and then we'll go to 0. So at infinity, we go to 0. And that should make our sum finite again. This is called the regularization step. We're taking the infinite thing, and we're cramming in this f function with some garbage inside that we don't care about. But the f function is going to go to 0 at some point, which means we don't have to worry about that infinite sum anymore. It's going to be finite. Where it's finite will depend on you know, the, the plasma frequency, our cutoff. But let's ignore that for now. Maybe it'll be fine. So at this point, uh, Casimir pulls another wonderful thing out of nowhere. I love it. It says, oh, the astute reader will notice that this thing is obviously true. It's like, <laughs> took, when I was reading this paper, it took me literally six months to figure out this derivation, so don't worry. Uh, he says, hey, um, Euler and McLaurin independently in like 1730-something uh, were working on this problem of the difference of sums and integrals. And they found that if you have an integral of some function and you subtract the sum over that same function, you can approximate it to a really good degree. This is some error term on the end. You can approximate it by having the sum to some small number of terms, call it p, uh, of some coefficients and then this is the function you're, you're taking from the inside of the sum. You take the derivative, the kth derivative. So the first one you do, you're going to get the first derivative. The second term is going to use the second derivative. The third term is going to use the third derivative. And you're going to evaluate those derivatives at n, which for us is infinity. That's the top edge. And at 0. Notice that nowhere in this form is there anything about the in-between behavior of the function. It doesn't matter what your function does in the middle, just as so long as it eventually goes to 0. This is incredibly disturbing. <laughs> like, um, what this means is that we can, we can just plug this formula in to our horrible uh, difference of integrals and sums, and something finite pops out. <laughs> so we, we take that function, we stick it in, and we apply this formula, and we're going to take the first term. These are the Bernoulli numbers, which are like, I don't know, uh, 1 over 12, 1 over or 4, 10, something. They're, they're numbers. They're small numbers. <laughs> Um, these numbers are bigger, though, which is important. These are, these are the factorials, so it's, you know, uh, five, 5 bang, 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Those numbers go up really quick, right, super quick. And so we only need to get a few terms before this thing becomes really huge and the total contribution becomes very small. So we do the first couple terms, and they're like 1 over 12, that's first coefficient. The derivatives at the starting point, at the ending point, at 0 and infinity, are 0 and 0, so that goes away. The next term, the second derivatives, um, it's like 1 over 720 times negative 4. Um, so anybody notice that like, the, this is not infinity? <laughs> we, we took what was originally an infinite um, you know, uh, difference of sums and integrals, and we added this term, f, and we ignored the plasma frequency. This stuff doesn't even matter anymore. And out pops this finite value, 1 over 720. This is wrong. This is so horrible. Like, infinity minus infinity is not 1 over 720. Why is it 720 and not like 
230 or 45.4. Why, why 720? What the fuck is going on? I, this, is, this, is, this is really unsettling. How many people in the room are uncomfortable? <laughs> you should be. Mathematicians are livid. They get really pissed off at physicists for doing this stuff. Uh, <laughs> and then sometimes they come around afterwards. So there's like imaginary numbers. What are those good for? Well, physicists found out eventually there's like some use for imaginary. So okay, we'll accept that. Mathematicians are like, you can't do integrals that way, or you can't have delta functions like that. And then eventually they figure out some math to make it work. Um, there's, there's a lot of hostility, a lot of interplay uh, between those groups. So we take infinity minus infinity, we get 1 over 720. Um, the reason we got there was because that, uh, that expression from Euler-Maclaurin doesn't depend on the intermediate values. So because it doesn't depend on the plasma frequency, we could take the plasma frequency all the way to zero, not actually zero, but very, very close, and still get the same results. And that fact that it's independent, that's called renormalization. So this is an early renormalization program, and it kind of sets the stage and is then abandoned for the way we do lots of quantum mechanics problems. This is so unsettling, people don't do this anymore. <laughs> We're looking back in time to an earlier, an earlier, uh, I guess, more Wild West mathematics era. Um, but it turns out that we can do the same derivation with a, a different kind of regulator. Uh, it turns into this thing called the Riemann zeta function for reasons. Uh, and the Riemann zeta function has this understood what's called an analytic continuation. It, it becomes finite in certain ways. Um, and, and those ways are deeply related to this like structure of the quantum algebra. It, it's mind boggling. Uh, but you get out the same number, 1 over 720, even if you do it different ways. Um, that tells us there's probably something there. Even though the math we did was wrong, it corresponded in some really weird way to something real, we hope. I mean, they didn't know, right? At the end of the paper, he writes that little note. It's like, this is kind of neat, isn't it? Uh, you know, an experimental verification seems not infeasible. Like, <laughs> maybe we could do this thing. Um, wouldn't that be cool? So we get back this term. Uh, I think it's on the next slide, actually. So this is, this is the force from Casimir. It's negative. The fact that it's negative means it's going to push the plates together. The, the sandwich box or the pizza box is going to compress. Um, H-bar, again, that means it's a quantum effect. If you want to tell if a system is quantum mechanical, you just have to find an H-bar in it. If H-bar goes to, so if you want to say, okay, what does the system do at regular human scales? You make H-bar zero, and then all the quantum stuff should disappear. So if you make this zero, all this becomes zero, and the effect disappears. This is good. We, we want that. If it divided by H-bar, making H-bar zero would make the universe explode, and that would be bad. So this is, <laughs> this is a good check, right? We're feeling confident about our mathematics. Uh, that's C, again, speed of light dependent, which is interesting because the speed of light changes based on the media you're in. So if you're underwater, speed of light is slower, so the effect gets weaker. Kind of cool. Uh, pi squared, 1 over 240. This is, this is the value of infinity, as everyone knows now. Um, 1 over 8 to the fourth. That means that the, the strength of the interaction is going to fall off to the fourth power. So it's, it's strong up close, but it falls off really, really, really quickly as you get slightly farther away. Regular forces that you were used to, like electromagnetic forces, like gravity, those fall off as 1 over uh, x squared. This one falls off as 1 over x to the fourth, so this falls off quicker. So having done this, you know, he submits this paper, and it goes relatively unread. As it turns out, the journal you publish in matters. Uh, this got published in sort of an obscure Dutch journal. Uh, I mean, it was not obscure in, in um, Holland, but it was not as big as Physical Review Letters, where the other one was published, I think. As a result, the sort of international physics community left it by the wayside for a while, and then it started to pick up steam. People started doing more interesting applications. One of the first things they tried to do was figure out how to make spheres follow the sound of the same equations. And Casimir said, hey, we don't really know what electrons are. Like, why? You're not allowed to have infinite charge at a single point. It would, it would be like a, an infinity, a discontinuity. So we think that the electron charge has to be spread out. Maybe electrons are little tiny beach balls made out of charge. What inflates the beach ball? Why doesn't it collapse? And he thought, oh, maybe it's, um, or no, sorry, it, they'll want to inflate, they'll want to expand because they're all negative, and negatives are called negatives. So the beach balls should explode. Something needs to hold them in. And Casimir thought, oh, maybe it's, it's the, um, the Casimir forces are pulling the edges together. This was entertained briefly for a while until we figured out that it's actually the opposite. The Casimir force in spheres pushes apart. So spheres will try to inflate themselves. 
Um, this happens because the shape of the waves on the inside, this is called the Jurassic Park mode. Uh, if you've ever seen the, you know, the T-Rex going and you watch the little ripples in the, in the uh, glass, they've got a special shape, right? It's called a Bessel function. Um, and that, that shape is actually more dense on the inside than it is on the outside. So there's more energy modes on the inside of the sphere. So spherical shells expand, plates contract. Corners are a real problem. When you look at spheres, if you get really close to a sphere, like right now, we're all really close to a sphere, right? How, how flat is the sphere? Pretty flat, yeah? Earth looks flat to me. So as you get really close, you can approximate these things as flat surfaces. But corners stay cornery the closer you get. Like if I went all the way into that corner and I got closer and closer, it would still look cornery. And that's a problem because that corner has an infinity hiding inside of it. And that infinity makes everything blow up again. So we have to do another renormalization. It's really problematic. What comes out of that is that corners will try to flatten. They've got too much energy crunched up inside of them, so they'll straighten out. Um, that's, that's weird. But it gets weirder. <laughs> <laughs> if, you take, if you take edges and you put them next to each other, the Casimir effect will try to suck them together. So if you cut a piece of tin foil, a, a very small piece, it will actually knit back together and try to heal. And if you, if you have little variations in the surface, the Casimir effect, it, it hates corners, so it tries to smooth out small variations. But it likes edges to come together, it wants, wants the planes to contract, so it will magnify big variations. So foils are actually kind of unstable systems, just due to the sort of random thermal jostling they experience all the time. Foils, if you leave them in empty space, will just crinkle up because of the Casimir effect. Um, my favorite is, is that if you take like uh, corrugated roofs, you know, like sine wave sort of patterns, you put them next to each other, they go sideways. This is, most forces go in or out, right? Not sideways, this is not supposed to happen. <laughs> but it does, so cool story physics. Um, a lot of people thought, cool story physics, They're like, what do, you, what do you mean? You're making all this stuff up. And uh, it took us quite a while, actually, to measure it. The reason is that it's really small. You have to do careful control of the geometry. And then there's all these you know, real world things that get in the way. You have to go super small to measure it. Um, for plates that are a centimeter in size and about 10 micrometers of distance, if you've ever tried to hold your thumb and forefinger together, you'll know it's kind of difficult to do that. So early scientists trying to measure this effect of their fingers didn't do too well. Uh, the other problem is that if you try to hold two plates close to each other, not only do you have to hold them up and down, but you have to keep them from wobbling. So there's like three, three axes to worry about. Um, that wobble actually makes it really tough to get a good, good result. Um, and even then, the forces are super tiny. We're talking about like 10 to the minus 14th newtons. Really, 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 really tiny forces. Uh, so they tried this. Uh, Sparnag tries in 1958. His error bars are bigger than the data. Uh, which is like a major downer. Um, they said, all right, some, someday. Uh, it takes until Lemero in, uh, the experiment was done earlier, but I think the publication is in 96 or 97. He says, oh, we can use a, a plane and a sphere. Uh, and that means you don't have to worry about the wobbling anymore, because it's a sphere. There's no, there's no preferred direction. Um, and they, they make up this thing. Uh, this is actually not Lemero, it's somebody earlier. They're called the proximity force theorem, which says you can approximate the sphere's interaction as a bunch of tiny little plates. So you, you pretend the sphere is made up of little plates that are kind of you know, arranged in a sphere shape, and you get back similar results. Um, we talked about metals reflecting. They don't reflect instantly at the border. The wave kind of like goes in a little bit, gets like bogged down, and then bounces back out. You ever see the matrix where uh, he like falls down the concrete? Similar sort of thing. He kind of like tunnels in for a bit and then bounces back up. So what you have to do when, you're, when your plates get close together is, is account for that um, sort of tunneling or, or effect. There's a technical word for it. Um, you also have to worry about thermal corrections. Like there's, there's going to be thermal photons. If your system isn't perfectly cold, they'll emit photons spuriously, which add to the box's energy modes, and you have to worry about those. Um, you also have to worry about conductivity issues. The nice thing is that the thermal effects and the conductive effects take place at different temperatures. So you can basically only do one or the other. You don't have to worry about both at the same time. It simplifies things. Um, the surfaces are metals. Real metals have like little patches of, or pools of electrons on them that will create tiny fields. Uh, so you have to apply charges to this whole thing. And when you charge the plates, they're going to try to repel each other or stick together. So you have to figure out how to subtract and cancel all that out as well. Um, so the modern experiments, they, they use these piezotransducers. They're little crystals that expand or contract, and you put current into them. 
um, use that plane in the sphere to worry about or to control the, uh, the rotation on the axis. Um, you use thin film depositions. You take a little ball of polystyrene and you, you vaporize a bunch of metal and let it condense onto the sphere and that gives you a really smooth surface. And you try to keep the thermal effects small. So far, they're small enough we don't have to worry. This is what you build. You take a, you take a big plate and you put it, um, you know the playground equipment where it's got a big spring in the middle and you can bounce on it and it kind of like pulls you back? You ever sat on one of those? So it's the same thing. Like this, this rod is under tension, it's a little spring. So you're gonna wobble, and the stronger the forces are, the faster the wobble is gonna be. Because you know, if, you, if you pull on something really hard, like on a, on a rubber band, you know how it snaps faster? If you relax it, it moves slower. Um, these, these wobbles are gonna be slower if the force is weak, and faster if the force is strong. So as you bring the sphere closer, the, the plane is gonna wobble faster, and you can measure the wobble bouncing a laser off of the plate, and looking for that laser beam crossing some detector periodically. So every time you see a flash, you know the frequency, and the frequency tells you the strength of the interaction. Um, that whole thing gets stuck onto a big piezoelectric transducer, and then you kind of elevate it very slowly towards the, uh, towards the sphere. And sometimes you can stick the sphere out in this little cantilever. This is a 100 micrometer, I believe, gold sphere. Um, it's, it's pretty cool, I think, that we can build these things. But you, not only do you have to machine something really, really tiny, but then you have to keep the whole thing in a vacuum and make it very cold. So you wrap it up in a whole vacuum assembly, <laughs> and this is, it's just, it's nuts, it's a hard experiment. Uh, so in 1948, that's when the paper was actually published, it said an experimental uh, confirmation might not be infeasible. It took until 96 or 97 to actually get a measurement to within about 5% of the error. Um, in 1998, we get to 1%. And in 2004, we start doing more interesting experiments, looking at dielectric behaviors where the metal will change its conductivity dynamically. You can get mirrors that turn on and off based on whether or not in the presence of hydrogen, which means you can control the Casimir force dynamically by adding hydrogen to the system. Um, that's still experimental, but people are working on it. So. We want to figure out how to compensate for those thermal corrections, figure out the limits of the proximity force theorem, that, uh, that approximation for spheres. Uh, we need to compensate for the potentials of voltage. Um, but it looks like the effect is real. In fact, it's so real that if you, if you take like 100 micron, like you know, basically a, a few hundred atoms across, sorry, sub-micron, 100 atoms across, the scales you get in, in microelectric machines, um, the force from the Casimir effect is like on the order of an atmosphere. We're talking like air pressure. That's like actually pretty significant. And in fact, it, it's the dominant force at small scales. <laughs> Things will stick to each other just because of Casimir effects. So when we're building these little tiny gears and little tiny machines, all these parts want to stick to each other because the Casimir effect is drawing them together. Or if we build little circles, they try to, they try to bow outwards because the Casimir effect's pushing them apart. So understanding this stuff is actually key to building more efficient machines. Um, as a more pie in the sky thing, some people are talking about Q thrusters, magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters that push off of the quantum vacuum. Um, as far as I know, these are still somewhere between pseudoscience to mystery. Uh, for one, the machines violate conservation of formentum, um, which is typically conserved, we think. Uh, <laughs> like, you shouldn't be able to pump energy in and no mass and not reduce mass and still go somewhere. So like either mass is coming from somewhere, going somewhere, or we're transferring enough radiation pressure out of the cavity. We don't know how it works. There is some thrust you can measure. And some of the experiments have been repeated, some haven't. It's a mystery. Um, the other big problem is people say, oh, it's pushing off of the plasma from the, from the virtual particles. Virtual photons do not behave as a plasma. So there's, there's no clear explanation for how that physics works. Um, but maybe someday, you know, we might find new physics. Uh, the other thing that people like to talk about with zero-point energy is fighting extra-dimensional invaders. Uh, this is my favorite. So if any of you have played this game uh, called Half-Life 2, there's these very large and scary striders, and uh, the hero takes a zero-point energy manipulator and grabs an object and flings it at the, at the attacker. And it would be great if we had this unlimited energy and we could you know, pick up stuff and fire it. So he grabs this metal F and he fires it up. Can we do that with the Casimir effect? Like, if you're really good at controlling fields, could you? Um, the answer is sort of. <laughs> so I did the math, you know, because for grins. Um, if you want to do this, you can move a 10 nanometer object weighing about 10 to the minus 20 kilograms, a really, really tiny F, 
you can fling it about 300 meters per second, which is pretty fast, uh, well, somewhat fast, at, like, uh, at a bacteriophage, and this is about 200 nanometers tall. So like, if we're ever attacked with bacteriophages, your zero-point energy manipulator will come in handy. Um, these are the important things you do as a physics student. Yes? Yes, they do want to stick together. Um, it's, it's a bit of a problem. <laughs> Nobody's quite worked out how the, how the math is going to go. Someday. So uh, this, this paper, although it was really obtuse, uh, it takes this very sort of circuitous path through a bunch of mathematics, and it pops out with this weird result that not only is there infinite energy in open space, but there's an infinite energy difference between sort of closed spaces and open spaces, that the boundary conditions the fact that the metal restricts the, the wavelengths possible, those induce energy differences. And that although those differences are infinite, we could play some really hokey mathematical games, which are wrong, by the way, they're not valid, and get back finite answers that also match experiment to like 1%. What's going on here? Um, this, this was later generalized by Lifshitz into the sort of overarching theory of interactions, and that covers colloidal stability. So the, it sort of subsumes the London effect, the van der Waals effect, this is how geckos stick to things. This is how um, mud and milk are stable. Uh, all these effects can be explained in terms of the vacuum interactions of the system. So it's cool. We took this, this old style understanding. It was like, let's take a classical field, and, and we'll retard it using um, the, the, the speed of light being finite. So we slow down the propagations. We get back some new results. You can take that whole framework and flip it around and think about this empty field as having energy. And those energies give back the same results. Really cool. Um, this is a geometry dependent effect, so the shape you're using matters, and it also depends on the material and the quantum scale. If you want to learn more about this, uh, Balian wrote this amazing paper, or actually maybe book, uh, Geometry of the Casimir Effect. It's got a whole bunch of overviews. Um, Casimir's paper that we read on the attraction between two perfectly conducting plates, very small, very obtuse, easy to miss, but it turns out to be really well known now, after the fact. Uh, Finally, if you want to learn more about quantum mechanics, I really recommend Townsend. It's a very approachable introduction. You really only need um, like linear algebra, not even, not even really calculus until about the middle of the book. Um, so it's a great way to get into this stuff if you want to learn. Uh, I have to thank a whole bunch of people who are all from my college. <laughs> uh, Brent Canetta for listening to the recent version of the talk, Fastlake for hosting, and of course, all of you for coming in. Thanks so much. Confused questions. So the the particles are mostly empty space, um, but at, the particles are mostly empty space. So why is it that the electromagnetic wave bounces off? of the metals, right? The metals are mostly empty, so why, why is this interaction? The reason is that while the particles are very far apart, the fields are actually quite strong. So like when you, when you knock on wood, you're not actually touching the particles, right? You're, you're bouncing off of the electromagnetic fields locally. So when your electrons get close to their electrons, they're going to repel. And it's that field interaction that actually bounces back. So even though they're, they're yes, very sparse, the fields actually reach out quite a ways. Cool. Well, oh, yeah. Yeah, there, there are numerical methods. And in fact, um, I wanted to show the, the sphere equation. The people who worked out the Bessel functions for the spherical shells, they've got this great integral that goes on for like a page. It's all these terms. And I think they only included it because it's like, oh, look at how hard we had to work. They did it all by hand. Um, nowadays, we have computers. Computers are much better. And so we can solve this stuff arbitrarily. All right, so I'll stick around up here to talk to anybody else who's curious about quantum mechanics or Casimir force in general. Thanks so much.